Hey there, everybody. Today we're going to take a look at the garden from a dyer's perspective. Um, there's some surprising things I don't think you probably know that you can do some dyeing with. Um, and I know I'm not going to get everything that I have that could be a dye stuff, but we're going to give it a shot. All right, so we're down on the curb here. Um, and the first thing that I would use would be zinnias, but since these are very light colored, they're not going to give off much dye. Uh, if you have some of the darker ones, the red ones, or even the burgundy ones, those will give you a nice dye. Um, next to it here, we have a barberry bush. This will give you a brown. Um, you can soak the trimmings every time you trim one of these babies um, in water for a couple days and um, then boil it good. It'll give you a nice brown. The next thing would be this. This is full of grain right now, but when they're upright, this is burgundy amaranth. Um, that will give you some interesting shades of pink and purple if you can get the dye to stick. It's a fugitive dye unless you have a really high acid content like um, mostly vinegar instead of water. I haven't tried it yet. Someone else had some really good results but then they had their pH around 3. So uh, maybe that'll give you a tip. Um, but I haven't tried it yet and actually gotten it to stick. Okay. This right here is St. John's wort, and I actually did plant it as a dye stuff, but it only gives you yellow, and I can get yellow from so many other things, so I use it as a medicinal instead of a dye stuff. Uh, the flowers really only bloom on midsummers or around that time frame. Um, I think mine came into full bloom around the 23rd of June. But um, this is St. John's wort. Um, it's a traditional dye for a long time. Um, I get a better yellow. This guy here isn't really in bloom anymore, but this is Coreopsis. I get a gold color from my Coreopsis. Um, it's, this one's gone to seed. It's a perennial. It'll, um, it's one of the first ones that starts to bloom um, about May. And if you deadhead it, it can last all summer. Um, I did a pretty good job deadheading this year, but I didn't get a chance to actually get out and pick because of COVID this being right on the street and so many people in our neighborhood not taking this disease seriously. Um, this is Coreopsis. That's the Blue Jay. This is Calendula. Calendula, I never have quite enough of this for um, a dye stuff, but I will mix it in with um, the, there's more Coreopsis growing out of the crack in the sidewalk. Um, I'll mix it with that, and I'll mix it with actual marigold. Let's see what we got down here. Right. Then you got more burgundy, amaranth. All right, here we got some marigolds. This, um is a slightly different species than the calendula. This is called Tagatus. Um, some people uh, believe it, it originated in Africa. It likes swamps. Don't ask me why, but it seems to grow here too. Um, and this is a dry, more of a Mediterranean bed and it, it's, it's tolerant of just about anything and it reseeds readily. So um, you use that in conjunction with the Coreopsis and the Calendula. Let's see what else we got.
This one's going to surprise you. See that tomato vine? When I'm getting ready to take those tomato vines down, uh, especially if I have earlier um, tomatoes and they aren't here until after frost, uh, tomato vines will give you um, sort of a muddy yellow, beige color. Um, you can also use bean vines and get about the same color. Um, so it's something to think about if you have a big garden and you have things that are done. Um, it still has to have some green in it in order to have dye stuff. So if it's actually been frozen, probably not. So here you can see this one. This one was chewed by deer pretty bad. All right, now we're gonna take a walk around to the other side here. All right, this is lemon balm. Lemon balm, or Melissa officinalis, is a wonderful tea, but if it's getting overgrown like this one, it can be cut back and used as a dye stuff. Um, I like it with mohair. If you have a nice fuzzy mohair, it gives you a beautiful lemony color. It's not quite as strong of a yellow on wool as it is on mohair. So another, you know, another fiber to consider. Um, dye stuffs do give different colors on, on different um, fi fibers, so experiment. If I can't get or don't have enough lemon balm to trim, I have sage. This is purple sage, but I have another one here in the front, and this gets really bushy early in the year and overtakes some of my other plants. So when I'm getting ready to cut the sage back, um, this one also gives a nice solid yellow on mohair. Um, it's about an average yellow on wool, but um, I like it on mohair. It, it really is quite pretty. All right. Then we go over here. This is rhubarb. Rhubarb is one of my very first dye stuffs of the year. As I'm uh, picking the stems for pies, I save the leaves and I first do a dye bath and then I just throw the leaves into the compost. Um, this one I prefer with alum. Uh, when you do it with alum, you get a nice solid yellow on wool. Uh, when you use it just outright without a mordant, you get sort of a khaki color. And um, rhubarb has been used in Great Britain for a mordant with other things like matter or I don't know what, what all else uh, some of the Scottish kilts were, were done with, but um, it, it's been around since the conquest of the Normans. The Normans brought it to Great Britain, um, so probably wasn't in the tartans, but it, it's been used over there for quite a while as a mordant. Uh, its primary constituent is oxalic acid. Um, Let's see what else I got going on over here. All right. Carrots. Carrot tops also give you yellow. Um, like the sage and um, some of the other things, it does look better on mohair, but it does give you a nice yellow um, it's a, it's a good dye stuff. It's fairly color fast. Um, I think a lot is dependent on the quantity. You need a large quantity of the leaves to get color. If you don't use a large enough quantity of the leaves, 
um, you don't get quite so much color saturation in your color. So that that's something to think about when you're dyeing. Um, I'm gonna switch to over here. This. This is a Japanese maple. And this is stunning for echo printing. It gives you some really interesting patterns. Um, echo printing. Any of the trees typically give you a tannin, a brown, um, and if you use it with iron, you're going to get um, beautiful printing because of the shape of the leaves on your fabric. So that's something to consider. Um, I'm not going to say cabbage because I've not got it to stick to fabric. It's a fugitive dye. It's something that washes out. So I don't use the cabbages. I have one more thing over here and it's not in bloom right now, so you'll have to pardon me. All right, this was bergamot. It was a red bergamot and I, I wanted to try it this year. It was very prolific last year, but we had a very hard season this year and it wasn't doing so well. I left it for the hummingbirds. They enjoy it immensely. So um, that's part of the pollinator garden. And although I wanna try it at some point, I did not do that this year. I'm hoping it comes back stronger next year and I can actually have enough of it to use as a dye stuff. Okay, we're gonna go take a walk to the other side of the garden. And there's some more marigolds. This is the jungle portion. Okay. This is the first year I was able to find indigo seed available on the American market. I know other people have been selling it for a long time on Etsy. This is Japanese um, indigo, Polygonum tinctoria. Um, and pardon me if I pronounce it vastly badly, but um, this, uh, I did some fresh leaf indigo dyeing with this and I was very happy with the results. Um, I plan on doing some more. I did not have enough leaves um, to, uh, oh, you have to dye a couple, two, three times to get a really strong color. And since you're actually just squeezing the leaves onto the fabric um, and rubbing them together, I wasn't sure I really wanted to try this on wool that would felt. I might try it on a superwash, but um, hopefully we'll get some next year. Um, I wanted to let this go to seed. It didn't quite get there yet. We are not at frost yet, but we're getting close. Went down to 36 last night, but it, it seems to be doing okay. I think once some of these tomatoes are out of here, it'll do better and we're gonna get warmer again next week. So hopefully it has a chance to actually bloom and give me some seeds. And with that, we're gonna go into the backyard. One more thing, sorry. This is still the tomato patch in the front yard. I planted these for next year. These are black hollyhocks. Black hollyhocks have, um, they give some beautiful, beautiful colors. They have so many flowers on their spikes, um, but you do need a lot of them in order to be able to dye anything in quantity. You can get anything from pink to a beautiful tan color. I'm mean, not even tan, almost a gray. It's um, really quite lovely. And um, I think next year we're gonna give them a go. They, they're a biennial. They are a biennial, so you have to plan ahead for these guys. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is also plant four or five more for the following year, next year, so that we have a constant supply of them because I can't count on them going to seed and reseeding. 
most of them do, but I managed to uh, lose a crop because of all the sunflowers in here. So, hollyhocks. All right, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you my oregano. I love my oregano. This year I had a dumpster parked in the driveway and I couldn't get at my oregano. I only got one small batch dyed with. Um, so, oregano is very prolific. It will take over entire yard. So I have it along the driveway so it's contained. Um, the bees love it. It's uh, wonderful in uh, as an herb for food. But I also, when I cut it back, um, I use it for dye stuff. And it gives a slightly different color in the spring versus in the fall. So something to think about too when you're dyeing is when to harvest because you'll get different colors, uh, sometimes stronger, in the fall. This is my tarragon. I did another video with this where we did a dye bath with the tarragon. And as you can see, it's regrown significantly and needs a haircut again. So if I get a chance to get my scissors out, I'll be snipping more of this off yet this year and putting it in a dye pot. And we're gonna maybe try out some of the copper sulfate and see if we can get a good green. Um, so this is tarragon. Let's see what else do I got hiding here? Juniper. You can get color out of juniper. Um, I think a couple years back I tried it and I couldn't tell you whether it gave me a yellow or a, green, or a brown. I could not. Um, I don't remember. It Honestly, when I trim this guy back, I'm usually more interested in making a wreath for the, for the Christmas season or uh, decorations in the house. It smells lovely. Um, somebody planted this back here in hopes of doing a bonsai garden back in the 1920s and obviously it was never maintained. It, it's a huge bush and I've I've kept it trimmed back a bit but it's still um, pretty big. It's definitely not a bonsai anymore. So um, yeah this this was a uh, this rock garden was originally sort of a bonsai kind of Japanese feel to it. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you, take a little walk around. It's a little too late for these guys. It's been getting cold. This is black raspberry. You can get a nice dye from black raspberry. I wouldn't use the berries. I have done the berries. We used to have a very prolific patch when I was a kid. Um, it's not, the berries don't give you a permanent dye. Not very well. Um, the leaves will give you, they're really high in tannic acid, so you can echo print with it or you can uh, dye with it. It gives, supposed to give you black, but I'm going to say gray because um, you can never get quite enough saturation for a true black with plants. All right, and then there are roses. Roses are really good for echo printing. I've not actually cut the leaves for um, a dye bath, but um, I suppose you could. They also, like the maple leaves in the front, have a lot of tannin and uh, will gladly put it on your fabric. So that's something to consider as a dye stuff. Okay, so out of all of these plants, um, yeah, here's one more. It's a weed. It's curly dock. It, um, the root is what's used on curly dock. It's supposed to give you yellow. 
if you live further west and you have red, um, red a red dock, um, sometimes I think they call it sheep's dock, um, it, it should give you a little stronger color. This one, not so much. Um, I haven't dug up the yard. This one just happens to be under brick. So it's not uh, getting dug up, but this will also give you a dye stuff. And I have heard that Clematis Vine will also give you a dye stuff. Um, I haven't tried it yet. I'd rather look at the flowers. When you realize so many plants give you a tannish yellow, um, you begin to lose heart and think that every plant in your yard is gonna give you tannish yellow. Um, and so because of that, I, I'd rather look at the flowers. Um, and I'd rather use something more like the abundance of the, um, the bee balm or the lemon balm here as, um, as a dye stuff. So there you have it. Out of all these things, the only thing I actually planted to use as dye stuffs were the Coreopsis and the Indigo. Have fun, explore, see you next time.